Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi Sean. 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 Maybe you should Hi, be Hi, Sheila. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't jump on any earlier, Kayla. It was a. Uh, I feel like I'm in the final sprint, like actually sprinting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just pulled into my place after a 14 hour day. So wow. it's been, it's yeah. been exciting. There's a lot, so much good stuff happening. Like voters are moving. I'm meeting them. It's, yeah. um, I hope it's enough. I hope so too, but I think you give a good impression to everybody. So I think oh, you are thanks, moving Sheila. them. Thanks. I'm trying. <laughs> You're doing a good job. Thanks. Well, if anyone read my Facebook post today, um, it I said I would finish Fenimore. Didn't quite do it. <laughs> I got about 50, 75 more houses to go. <laughs> so. Wow. That must have meant you had some good discussions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it, almost every time I go out, I have good discussions. Yeah, there's, there's, um, yeah, I met someone who, um, she said, um, you know, I'm a Republican. I think Travis is a good guy, but I really don't like how the Republicans have been treating Evers. And wow. so I don't know what I'm going to do. She said, I'm really glad you stopped. Wow. <laughs> I, wow. I didn't know what to do yet. <laughs> so yeah, it's making it worth it. Yeah. You know, conversations like that. Right. I'm going to stop talking so we can actually do what <laughs> we came here to do tonight. <laughs> Thanks, James, for hosting. More than happy to do it. And by the way, you're going to do plenty of talking and also some listening tonight because we do have some questions, uh, some good questions, and I'm sure we'll be receiving others from the uh, audience here as well. I yeah. think what we'll do is uh, give people about uh, five more minutes to log on. And uh, fully understand that there's a um, another a political event going on that has some interest to uh, possibly members of this audience, uh, your moderator included. So I will make sure that we do finish by eight o'clock. Good. Good. Because we're leaving. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm smart enough. Go goodbye. <laughs> Got to go root for Kamala. <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, Brianna, is that your name? I'm, have I met you yet? Oh, is she frozen up? Frozen, must be frozen. Okay. Well, when you uh -huh. unfreeze, <laughs> I'd love to meet you. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh. There's that broadband. Yeah, that's There's the that broadband, broadband trouble. Put that question at the top, James. <laughs> well, we thought Travis had solved all those problems. <laughs> By what he said in the telegraph, it's 100%. <laughs> yeah. You did imply that. Hi, Michelle. Good to see you. I do think I'm here. Good seeing you. <laughs> and I, I don't see Marty and Chris, but but I see your names. I hear Marty. <laughs> Sometimes people will keep their camera off just to conserve some of that uh, that bandwidth. Band. Yeah. Yeah. Totally understandable. Okay. I, I think we're going to get uh, started if we may. First off, my name is James Schneider and I'm a member of the Richland County Democrats. I'm a lifelong uh, member of the uh, Democratic Party, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, I don't look at the candidates first to make sure that they have the qualifications that I wanna support, and I'm sure that you're doing the same. Uh, you're looking at all the candidates running for office and making sure that they're the type of people that you want representing you, whether it's in Madison or in uh, locally, or if it's in, on a federal level. What our format tonight is going to be very low key and casual, but that said, I do have uh, just a little bit in the way of guidelines. I will be your moderator for this evening. 
uh, you, several of you have sent in questions that you would like to have um, Sean respond to, and I will be reading those specific questions. And Sean will certainly have that opportunity to uh, respond to those and to add any additional information that he might feel is relevant. I would also encourage you, I, I'm going to ask that all of you mute yourselves uh, during this uh, part of this uh, session. And uh, if you do want to make some comments, there's a chat area below. I'm sure many of you are familiar with how to use that. And Kayla will be monitoring that. And I will be asking her at various times if there are specific questions that are in the chat that she would like to introduce on your behalf. That will be the first part of our meeting. The second part will be the more informal part where a small group like this will have the opportunity to basically uh, have that uh, informal chat between amongst ourselves and to uh, you know directly ask uh, Sean questions uh, you know as part of a, of a group effort. So hopefully that will be uh, respectful of all your times and get some questions answered. Uh, we'll be focusing on farm related issues because this is a farm town hall as it has been related. But if there are other things that you want to bring up, uh, we've been talking about broadband and that's uh, in the uh, pre-discussion. And that's certainly a, a farm and rural, you know, affects all of us no matter what our location. Uh, Sean, although I'm sure everybody here already knows you, um, I'm going to call on you directly to uh, officially introduce yourself to this group and to give us a little bit of your background on why you feel that uh, you are qualified to address us on farm-related issues. Sean, you're, my, uh, you're muted. Yep. There you Thanks. go, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, so um, yeah, my name is Sean Murphy Lopez and I'm running for the 49th Assembly District and I'm running against Travis Trannell. Um, so I got involved in politics about two and a half years ago. I got elected to the Richland County Board of Supervisors. Um, I live out in the country in Northwest Richland County and um, I grew up on a farm uh, with my dad. Uh, my mom and my dad had a farm that they lost to bankruptcy in the 80s. And uh, my parents split up, but my dad always stayed in farming. Um, so he got a different farm after my parents split up and um, has been a livestock dealer uh, and, and trader and has raised some livestock. Uh, he's been really involved in 4-H over the years, um, helping uh, my siblings and, and other kids in the community uh, stay involved in farming. Um, when I was in my mid-20s, I left Minneapolis the first time. I've left Minneapolis twice. <laughs> um, the first time when I left, I went uh, to Western Iowa and bought a little acreage and started raising organic um, vegetables. I had uh, pigs. Um, chickens, started raising meat birds. So I did this kind of little old fashioned farm deal. <laughs> and um, during that time, I got to spend more time with my dad who was really making more of a living at it and with my grandma who had retired from farming. And I ended up going back to Minneapolis and coming back um, to the country six and a half years ago. And that's when we landed in Richland County. And I was drawn to this area because of all the organic farming, um, all the a lot of the success that different people had had in this area actually making a living uh, doing organic farming. I wanted to learn from them and, and be in that sort of atmosphere. So we bought 80 acres. Um, we did raise organic pork uh, for a couple of years when we first moved here. We sold it at the Viroqua Farmer's Market. Um, we sold it at a little shop that we had in Viroqua and then we also sold it off our farm. Um, so I really got a good that was even a better experience about how hard it is to make money um, at farming. And, you know, I have a lot of respect for people who actually make it work like my dad and my grandma and a lot of you on this phone call. Um, I know there are a lot of people who are interested in farming and who would get involved if, if there was more uh, opportunity, uh, if, you know, it was easier for people to make a living. And I do think that you know, this is obviously a run for state assembly. It's not a run for the US Congress, which sets most of our farm policy. But I do think the state assembly does, or the state legislature and the state as a whole, they do play a role in farm policy. Uh, we have a state department of agriculture 
They often hand out money. They implement regulations, uh, carry out different laws. Um, we also have a set of laws around farming uh, in this state. And, and the legislature has a lot of say in that, of course, you know, writing the laws and, and working with the governor to implement them. Um, I do believe in the past we've had more, I think the state has played a more proactive role in trying to keep farmers in business. Um, you know, organizing co-ops uh, or writing laws that allow people to organize co-ops. Um, you know, we have a strong tradition of that here in Wisconsin. Um, also, you know, defending farmers against outside threats that don't allow them to make a living. You know, we have some history of that in Wisconsin and in the country as well, you know, against monopolies. And so those are the sorts of things that I'm really interested in looking at and getting involved with. But I also want to learn from people who are farming right now, um, you know, find out what ideas they have for how we can make farming more viable in Wisconsin and how we can become a leader in our country uh, as far as keeping people on farms and making it um, viable to not have to have another job uh, and keep, keep kids out in the country, keep businesses running, uh, keep schools going, things like that. Sean, uh, one of the questions that came to my mind as I was listening to your uh, the first comments is you mentioned that you're a, a supervisor for the Richland County on the Richland County Board. And uh, I look at your address and it's a Hillsboro address. And I'm sitting there going, what is a guy from Richland County doing representing what is basically an assembly district that is mostly Grant County? And the reality is, I think this is a good chance for us to remind ourselves that uh, there's a very uh, complex and confusing way that we have set up our assembly districts. And one of the issues that all of us, I see people nodding their heads, uh, the issue of fair maps and the like. I would just remind people that in Richland County itself, there are three different candidates who represent a portion of that county, yourself being one of them. Uh, the majority of the 49th Assembly District is, it includes all of Grant County. Uh, I believe there's seven towns in Richland County and a small area of Lafayette County. Uh, you have that all very uh, nicely enumerated on your uh, website, uh, seanforruralwisconsin.com. So uh, you're representing a rather, um, you know, a rural, but still a very diverse pool area. Uh, as you were talking about the impact that you can have versus the uh, federal impact and that and the like, uh, one of the things that you talk about on your website is uh, eliminating the ag manufacturing tax credit. And I'd like to ask you, or this is one of the questions that we have, uh, the person who submitted this would like to know what impact that would have and also how would you help ag and rural manufacturing? So regarding the manufacturing tax credit, that has been one of the items where I, I have been hitting my opponent fairly hard on that. He was um, one of the original people who signed on to it. I, I believe this was a Governor Walker idea back in 2012, 2013. And I wouldn't say that the entire manufacturing tax credit. I don't know if anyone's noticed that. <laughs> I don't usually throw the ag part into it, but um, the ag portion of it only makes up about 10% of the, the payouts for that. So it's not really a significant piece of it. And as far as the entire tax credit goes, when you include the manufacturing side, 95% of the money goes to people who make more than 250 grand a year. So I did have a gentleman call me from rural Platteville and he, he you know, he was a little worried when, when I was against, when he heard my radio ads about the manufacturing tax credit. And he was a solar producer and he doesn't make that much money, but he uses the manufacturing tax credit. I've got no problem with the manufacturing tax credit for people who make below a certain amount of money. Um, I would love for us to start phasing it out for the wealthier people who are taking advantage of the manufacturing tax credit. Um, you know, they've, they've had a lot of, they've had what? A lot of investments. And I, I think we need to start weaning them off those handouts at this point. 
So I don't want to necessarily get rid of the manufacturing and ag tax credit. I just think it needs some pretty strict reforms. Um, so th there's going to be a lot of um, um, funding. You know, that's 1% of all of our state income tax and sales tax goes to the manufacturing and ag tax credit. It's a pretty big chunk of our budget, of our $17 billion, whatever our big amount of a budget is. Um, I don't know that we necessarily need to pull away the ag side. I'd have to learn more and look look at, you know, what incomes of people does that go toward? But, but we need to pull it back, especially if, I guess if we've got really wealthy um, farmers who are using it, I think we need to take a look at that. Did I answer the whole question or was there another piece to it, James? That, that, was, uh, that was the first part and uh, thank okay. you for asking. The second part is what would you specifically do to encourage ag and rural manufacturing? So one of my, one of my ideas that I've been talking about with folks and I've been asking for some reactions to this is to take some of that manufacturing tax credit and start redirecting it toward rural areas that are in decline. And people who were to open up small businesses or say they're opening up new small, which could include small farms, start having some of that tax credit go toward these places that really need it, where we're seeing the dropping schoolment, the falling populations, um, the main streets uh, drying up, um, not really good jobs. You know, you can tell it when you drive through some of these places, the houses are falling apart. People don't have money to put into their roofs or siding. Um, those are the places I think we really need to focus those tax credits um, and more direct them towards smaller businesses. That might include some manufacturing plants. Um, so I, I think that's how I would try to, you know, how would we actually help, you know, new farmers get started? You know, allow them to take, if someone has saved up capital, to put that capital into a farm and then get a tax credit for doing it in an area where we're suffering with declining farms. You know, I, I think we could just start rethinking our tax credits. We don't have to totally get rid of them. They are kind of ideas to encourage people to do the right thing. Um, I just think we need to be encouraging different people in very specific areas to do the right thing. Okay, thank you, Sean. Our next question uh, that we received in advance, and this is one that uh, everyone uh, is uh, certainly aware of, uh, with uh, COVID and the pandemic, pandemic that we are currently dealing with, one of the very first uh, issues that was uh, really brought to our attention at the beginning of this was a shortage of packing capacity. As a lot of people look to say, okay, you know, can we get, uh, can we buy uh, a quarter of, uh, of, of uh, beef or if we can, you know, uh, can we process um, locally to, in order to fill our, our freezers and meet our own personal needs. And what was really brought to our attention is that uh, there's a very much a shortage of that capacity. We've seen a decline in local meat and dairy processing in small communities and as larger plants have uh, replaced them. What would your be? What would your approach be to address this very obvious decline in our rural areas that is uh, needed by all of our rural con uh, constituents, not just those on farms? Yeah, I've noticed this problem, and I of course experienced it when um, when we were butchering. You know, I would take our hogs to the butcher, and the the amount of wait that's going that went on even back pre COVID was was pretty long, and now of course it's you know what, 10 months at the Richland Locker right now is the last I heard is, as far as if you want to get a bee for a hog in there for butchering. So I think what the state could be doing is we could, we could um, create a program uh, within the ag department where we are incentivizing smaller butchers and, and smaller processing plants to open. Uh, and where to get the money for that is a, is a good question. Um, but I, I think that they're going to need some help with um, capital. They're going to need some help with dealing with new regulations. I, I'm sure that the existing butchers who are out there were able to grandfather, be grandfathered in for some things and to get started new is going to be so challenging to, to rebuild that. 
And I, I think we could be um, uh, creating some sort of incentives for people to get involved in that again. And, you know, I think maybe looking at some of those big plants, especially that are owned by corporations that are outside of the, you know, Wisconsin that are making money off of us, you know, there might be ways to tax them to, um, to create a program like that and come up with the funding. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, I do think it's a big need uh, and I hope we can, we can encourage that. I, I think the demand is there. I think it must just be a lot of the regulations. I, I bet that has got to be a challenge for the new folks getting started right now. Uh, one of the things we always hear is how divided our society is. And I think that's really been brought to our attention and to the forefront in this, uh, you know, in this current political situation. But uh, it's always been there in uh, rural areas. And there's been some real sincere and uh, strong questions about uh, big farms versus small farms, about rural versus urban. And it's, there's a tendency sometimes to sit on one or other sides of that uh, divide and to, well, disparage the other side. Let's put that about as gently as, as we can. But the question becomes is, is there a role for various size producers? Um, is there a role for diversity in the future of our rural areas? Uh, what's your thoughts on that and how would you approach encouraging people to look across this divide and understanding each other a, a, a little bit better? Um, you know, when I, I do a lot of door knocking, obviously, and uh, about three or four weeks ago, I decided to stop by this farm in Bloom Township where I live. And it's the biggest dairy farm in our township. It's on a ridge top, and I'm not sure how many uh, I think they've got like six or 700 animal units now. So they, they have to actually get a permit from the county because we regulate um, livestock farms of that size. And, you know, I'm, I'm obviously kind of a proponent of small farms. I mean, look what I was doing, you know, uh, but, but I want to make sure I'm talking to people of all sizes to understand, you know, what they think about things. And so I, I just stopped and, and um, let them know I was running and, and I was really surprised, you know, they, um, they told me, you know, they said, we didn't really necessarily want to get this big, but we've kind of had to. And it seems like every time we decide to expand, the ag economy collapses. So we're like really unlucky. You know, we, we seem to take out the loan for the new, um, you know, the new building every time, you know, the shit hits the fan <laughs> with the farm economy. And so um, actually, I, I asked Myron uh, when, when I was first uh, starting to run, you know, what thoughts did he have um, on, on uh, different ag policy things that could change? And, and Myron, I hope you don't mind. I've shared this idea with a few other people because I want to know their reactions to it. You know, what if we had some sort of a program where um, in, with different commodities, the floor dropped after a certain amount of production. So the federal government will guarantee a, a certain price, you know, say if you're a dairy farmer with, you know, up to uh, 200 cows, but then after that, they wouldn't guarantee the price or like similarly for corn or soybeans or whatever the commodity is. And not all commodities are supported right now, of course. Um, but I've been shopping that idea around and, and I asked, I asked uh, some people in Lancaster, I think I asked those folks in Bloom Township that too. And a lot of people are just like, let me think about that. Like, I really want to think about it. And like, I don't really know what we should do. I, I hear a lot of like, I don't know. You know, when you ask farmers right now, what should we do? <laughs> and I think we just need to have more conversations because I know there are farmers who have ideas and really good ideas. Um, like Myron and, and other folks, I'm sure on this call too. And we need to have more conversation around it. And so instead of just saying, um, you know, like when, Tra when Travis responded to Sonny Perdue's, you know, slam on small farmers that he had about a year ago. And he said, we defend all farm type, you know, here, but then where's the action on it? There, there's not much action. And I think that's what we need to be uh, we need to be having that conversation. So say you want to say stay small and don't want to grow above 
250 dairy cows, how are you going to do it? What, what are some different policies in place or, laws, um, or do we need to start going after some monopolies, um, our justice department here in Wisconsin? I, I think there's ways for, we just have to be more, I'm more open-minded now after doing this job, talking to different farmers, you know, to say, okay, so what do you, you know, ask the guy and, or, the guy and the gal, the family with 2000 cows, what do they think about it? You know, does anyone ever ask them if we just put them on defense right away, we might not get good ideas out of them too. But I think people of all sizes probably have some good ideas if we can talk about what a common vision might be for people being able to make a living. Sean, when, when we talk about food and farm related issues, uh, one of the first things that comes up is people talking about the price of food. Well, availability first, obviously, but then the price. And what often gets lost in that discussion is the quality of food. Uh, we tend to just say, you know, what's it going to cost and how can we produce everything and get everything as consumers at, uh, at low cost as possible. And while that's understandable, if we're losing the discussion of quality, What's the impact that that has on uh, producing, especially for smaller producers, where the costs um, might be a little more challenging to keep that uh, as low as you'd like, and yet there might be a quality difference. How do we and how do you, as a legislator, uh, let our, uh, the people in Wisconsin know that there is uh, you know, a, a quality issue that needs to be addressed, that needs to be a part of that discussion, and the impact that that discussion has on smaller producers. Well, I, I think that our UW system could be brought into this uh, with this type of a question to say, where can we start doing research on uh, quality of, of different food products? Um, I don't really hear much talk about that. I, 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 don't, I don't think that that's going on right now. You know, we just made this huge investment in a dairy innovation hub. Um, and I'm not really sure that that even came into the conversation. And, and I think it should. I think we need more research around it, more education. But, you know, obviously this has happened in the past when, you know, um, I know up here I've had farmers tell me when they decided we couldn't use spring water anymore in our milking parlors, you know, that took a lot of farmers out of business because now we, everyone had to have wells. Well, that was for grade A milk or whatever it was, whatever grade it was. And so we, we've had quality discussions in the past. Um, I, I also think um, that if we start having you know, more discussions around control of the supply of different products, I just read an article in the Wisconsin Farmers Union magazine a couple nights ago about how we do have several crops um, that where we do have control over the supply um, cranberries, sugar beets, those are a couple examples. We used to have it um, for tobacco um, in our neck of the woods. I know that one of my farmer friends out here said that um, the farm government office used to come out and say how, how much of a um, field, how big of a field you could have. Um, and they called them allotments back then. They weren't called quotas. Um, but if we start having more of those discussions and it spreads to other uh, crops besides those more limit that more limited group i think that might be a good opportunity to start having discussions about the quality of things so how can we raise the quality of products instead of just having more and more quantity constantly there might be ways to uh, reward people who are focusing more on that you know, we, we created a, an entirely new property tax classification system, it seems, about 10 or 15 years ago or whenever that was, where agricultural land is taxed at a lower rate um, than other land in Wisconsin. And, you know, maybe we need to create some sort of a, a program on quality of uh, uh, food raised on agricultural land. And and if the quality is really good, maybe they should get a discount on their property tax rates and, and everyone else should have theirs bump up a little bit to fund that. So there might be ways that the government can uh, start to encourage this discussion on, on quality. Those are some ideas I thought about when I first read this question. I think it's a really good question. I definitely don't have all the answers to 
to this one or any of the other questions. I'm just sharing with you my thoughts at the moment, of course. <laughs> Uh, just a reminder to everyone, I know there's at least one question that has been submitted in chat in just a couple of minutes. I'll be asking Kayla to uh, relay that to us. But if you have uh, some questions that come up just as you're listening to Sean, please feel free to uh, put those in the chat area and we'll make sure that those are addressed. But going back to our list uh, for at least one more here, and this is something we were talking about before we formally started the meeting is the issue of uh, broadband. Number one is, uh, do you think that improving broadband will have an impact on attracting more residents, possibly including a part-time farmers to area? Also, uh, would you help current residents, especially farmers broadband, so they have access to additional ways to sell their crops? So what do you think the, you know, our future is in getting broadband? And what do you think more importantly that impact uh, potentially can be both in our rural communities and for farmers themselves. Yeah, I, I think there's a pretty huge demand for it right now. I mean, this issue keeps coming up again and again. And right now, especially with so many people uh, doing virtual school with their kids and then uh, working from home as well, it's become more of a, um, it's very uh, much more apparent now that it's a, it's a need. It's not just like a desire to lay around and watch Netflix at night, you know, on high speed broadband. Um, so I do think that the state, uh, and I think I've mentioned this, some of you might have heard some of my response on this before. I think the state could be more careful about where they're directing their uh, broadband money. We didn't have any funds come to Grant County in the last round at all. Uh, Richland County actually did get some funds um, so we do have a couple projects going on right now, but I think that the state needs to be more careful so that so that it's being spread out more equitably. If you don't don't have a government sponsor, a local government sponsor on a project, we we need it spread out more. We can't have you know a county as big as Grant County not seeing any money, and if they're supposedly raising the money amount so much, you would think we could at least get one project in Grant County. Um, I know that it's possible to raise that more if we reprioritize some other things we're doing uh, at the state, like the manufacturing tax credit, peeling some of that off perhaps, but there, there will be a lot of demands from different, different people or different um, interest areas, you know, education, tax credits, broadband. Um, so another idea that I've been thinking about is how can the state be encouraging smaller companies to form around um, being internet service providers. Um, and a lot of these grants are going to really big companies too. And those big companies, I'm not sure what ev everyone's experience is like, but my experience out here where we live is the big companies that serve, we have a big company out here where I live right now serving us with the internet. The customer service and the, the local um, jobs, it, it's just, they're not good. Just over the hill, if we go into Yuba where we have an apartment building and we have internet over there, we have a local co-op with 40 employees and their customer service is amazing. The quality is a lot better. So I think the state should be looking at if we're gonna be giving all this money away, who are we giving it to? And then finally, I know we have to get the federal government more involved in this broadband issue. Um, you know, when we couldn't figure out how to um, get electricity out to all these places because companies couldn't make money, they formed a lot of co-ops uh, out in rural areas and the federal government helped with rural electrification. I think we need to be going to our, our representatives at the government, at the federal government level and say, you know, if we're gonna be investing in rural areas, if you really wanna start helping rural people and turn around some of this negativity people have toward the federal government, how about you start you know, create internet broadband, come up with some great acronym and name for it, like REA or RFD, you know, um, I, I think that's gotta be a big priority because as a state, we cannot afford to build broadband out in all the rural areas on our own. I just don't think we can do it as taxpayers here. You know, you do bring up one point. We're very fortunate that a number of rural uh, cooperatives, both electric cooperatives and uh, phone uh, operators, the small ones in our area, 
have been leaders in this er in this. Uh, I my personal experience is living in Gotham. I received mm -hmm. while everybody was trying to get uh, service, and we actually had, had internet connectivity here in Gotham uh, ahead of most of Madison, due to the Blue River Telephone Company working jointly with Richland Electric Cooperative, and so. Again, those cooperatives have played and care directly about us. So that's been a great role model. I would also point out too that uh, when this discussion is ever made, uh, the rich, the um, Reedsburg municipality, their uh, co -op, their uh, the broadband services that they provide are oftentimes used as a model of what a community-led effort can actually accomplish. Unfortunately, the state of Wisconsin is now one of 22 states that forbids that sort of activity by municipalities, uh, which is something that, um, you know, Sean, do you any comments on that or potential that that could be addressed so that our communities could partner with the rural areas uh, around them to um, well, address this issue? Let's fix it. Let's change the law. <laughs> I, I, I have heard about I've heard about that I've heard little little bird one time I think mentioned something about that so okay uh, Kayla uh, you have in uh, chat there's at least one question there would you like to share that with us please and uh, ask Sean that yeah we have a question from Brianna and she's asking we are currently experiencing a large private company pressuring farmers to lease their land for a utility scale solar facility Southwest Wisconsin is being pursued heavily by the private companies for renewable energy. Wisconsin has no rules for siting utility scale solar. Wisconsin needs rules and strategies for siting utility scale renewable energy. Do you have any idea on this subject? Um, <clears throat> I'm fairly familiar with, well, I shouldn't say fairly. I'm somewhat familiar with this because we had a big solar farm probably down in James's neck of the woods. Um, that was that came to the Richland County Zoning Committee, um, and it it was a little bit of a um, mess because right there are no rules. It doesn't seem it, it's really just up to the local. Um, I believe counties. I believe the counties are the deciders on on this. Although I'm sure the zones townships might have some say too. Is that? Um, um, I thought you were saying something, Brianna. <laughs> I realized you were telling someone else to be quiet. <laughs> I get it now. Um, I I don't think we really have much of a plan in Wisconsin about where we want to go with wind and solar. I, I think we need goals around having more renewable energy. Um, I know that they did this in Iowa many years ago, back in the 90s, um, and they are a leader in wind uh, energy production. I think the opportunity we have in Wisconsin is to learn from what Iowa did and figure out how to make it um, probably more palatable to local residents. Because I have, I, I have heard complaints even over there about the shadows and how those big wind turbines cause problems for people on acreages sometimes um, if a farmer right next to them rents out too close to their house. And I think it's similar with the solar issue. Um, it would be nice if we could figure out how to do more small, uh, small solar, what do they call them? Solar gardens or fields? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, instead of such massive ones, you know, I, we obviously need more um, energy created from, from those renewable sources. I think we just need to figure out how to do it to, to give, property owners more rights um, in rural areas. But at the same time, this could be a great source of income for farmers. So I, I think we have to balance those two things. Um, the final question is also being addressed in uh, one of the comments that is made in the chat uh, re relates to the bottom line is clean water. And uh, municipalities have been required to reduce phosphorus and nitrogen from their waste and water treatment plants to levels that require significant increase in cost. At the same time, the issue of making sure that we have clean water available in all of our areas, whether it's uh, the community themselves or from that well uh, that most farmers rely on. 
And yet farmers themselves are struggling with manure management and making sure, and nutrient management, making sure that uh, they're managing things properly and not contributing to the problem, but at the same time addressing all of this in a responsible and affordable manner. What are your uh, thoughts about uh, the, the issues of facing us with uh, clean water and the impact that it has on our communities and the costs that they incur, and also the challenges to farmers as well? I think number that's a big one. That's OK. I think number one with clean water is we need more data around it. Um, on the Richland County Board, I'm on the Land Conservation Committee, and we considered doing what uh, Grant, Iowa, and Lafayette County was doing uh, a couple of years ago with doing a big study. And we, we partnered with Vernon and Crawford counties uh, to start um, doing some random testing of well water uh, out in the country. And I read through the SWIG study that was done for Grant, Iowa, and Lafayette counties, and I have a hard time following a lot of what they're saying. And there was a lot of confusion in the news. Uh, um, there were different stories coming out, and there was a lot of drama around that, of course. But um, I think we need more data and more information and education for people. One of our um, suspicions up here in Richland County is that more of the drinking water pollution is down along the Wisconsin River, where there are a lot of farms with sandy soil. But we don't know that because we've never measured it. We've never collected the data. No one's ever really looked at it. So um, I constantly hear that, you know, I've been following this debate also over in Iowa, where they have a lot worse problems than we do here. Uh, and you hear this tug and over between the urban and the rural areas, you know, so the wastewater treatment plants and the farmers. And that's another area where I think we need more information and education and the septics out in the country here, that, that's always coming up as well. But I know part of the question, because I re did read it before we started, had to do with, well, how can cities afford to do all this stuff? Because they're having to put up new wastewater treatment plants and that falls on cities with fewer and fewer revenues. And I think if the state is gonna make it such a priority to have cities get their phosphorus levels down, I think the state should come up with some matching monies uh, to help local communities. Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly how to do that. And I, I've got to get involved with the state budget to really, to really see what's happening so far. Um, but, but I do think that there should be some help. Now, I believe a lot of that though comes from utility payers. So it might not come from property taxes, it might come from people's water bills in these cities. And so they may be able to raise rates to uh, deal with some of those new wastewater treatment plants, but we're obviously going to need additional help. And I'm assuming from the federal government as well. Um, you know, as far as the pollution that comes from farms, you know, I, we just are going to have to have some tough conversations about it after we get the data. Once we see, you know, where the concentrations are at, um, you know, we're going to need ideas from people about how they reduce that. You know, where where we've got this great big beautiful country. I know this has been figured out in other places. Let's figure out, you know, how people have reduced some of that pollution in, in the groundwater, and and start asking farmers. You know, do you have ideas for how we can implement these things so we can improve the quality of our drinking water? Um, it, there's there's got to be some of those conversations happening, and ultimately, you you have to create rules if you're going to get people to do things. But you can't make everything a rule. You, you have to take people in the conversation of setting those. Sean, I have one uh, personal question that I want to ask you, and this is similar to one you've heard uh, before in a forum you participated in. You've been going out knocking on doors. I mean, this is one of the most challenging campaigns I've ever seen for anybody who is a candidate for public office. Uh, we don't have the traditional meetings, gatherings uh, that we would normally have where you can get your message out. So you still have been going out, pounding on as many doors as, as you can, both uh, in communities and out in the rural areas. 
what are you hearing from the people that you do have the opportunity to talk to? Um, and what's the difference or is there a difference between what you hear in the small communities and, and in our communities and what you hear from those who are living outside of a, an incorporated area and on, the, on our farms? So I do spend most of my time in the villages and the cities. I've taken a couple days and just driven country roads and talked to people out in the country. Um, but time-wise, because everything has been so compressed, I kind of started a little late, early May. <laughs> early voting started the third week in September. Um, I've really concentrated on areas where I can hit as many places as possible. Um, plus more of our base is in the cities and the villages. The country tends to go more Republican. So there's a couple, you know, a couple of reasons why I've been doing that. Um, what, what I'm hearing from, you know, one thing I just want to mention about this, it, like we all listen to the national news, like a lot, <laughs> we get a lot of it. And I, I keep hearing again and again, like this kind of confusion that anyone would be undecided at this point, <laughs> you know, or everyone's made up their mind. And I'm always just like, no, they haven't. <laughs> I am like, I'm talking to these people. I mean, they are in our area. For whatever reason, we have a lot of independence out here. And I'm sensing that they are moving. I'm talking to Republicans. Who, they were Republicans or they're, they're like John Kasich Republicans or you know George Bush Republicans. They are moving. They, you know, and... A lot of these independents, they'll say things like, I don't vote for the person. Or, I, was, I don't vote for the party. I vote for the person. Um, so they're not always former Republicans. Sometimes they truly do move back and forth. I'm hearing a lot of um, anti-incumbent uh, sentiment, uh, which works in my favor. <laughs> I always like that. Um, um, I'm seeing more and more people lately take the COVID thing more seriously. When I first started door knocking in July, people weren't taking that that seriously. I'm seeing more and more people coming out with masks when they open their doors now. Um, uh, I'm running across a lot more houses that have COVID and are quarantined. Um, so I do think a lot of the I think a lot of the strategic moves that the Republicans made early on in this pandemic are now, I bet they're gonna come back to haunt them is what I'm thinking is going on right now. Cause I'm, especially from older seniors, I'm hearing more and more concerns, but even all sorts of ages of people, um, especially, you know, probably in their thirties and forties and fifties, you know, the, that sort of age group, I'm feeling more concerned from a lot more people. Just some anecdotes to, to throw your way about kind of what I'm hearing from folks. You know, um, and, and I also want to invite all of the people who are participating here tonight, just to remind them to be supportive of, uh, of Sean's uh, campaign. As much as he is doing, as much as he is pounding on doors and doing everything he can to get the word out, the reality is the biggest impact that you can potentially have is to support his campaign in a number of ways. Uh, if you can uh, donate to the campaign, obviously that has an impact, but uh, it goes that you can donate your time as well. And I'm sure if you contacted Sean and talked to him about ways that you could be supportive of his campaign that didn't directly cost dollars, say uh, he would have it, he and uh, Kayla would certainly be more than willing to work with you. But also, reaching out to your neighbors and friends, your family. And don't assume, Sean brings up a good point here. Don't assume that people have their minds made up on any of these races. And they're going to respect your opinion because you are a friend of theirs. You are their family members and you are people that they have known for a long time. And it says, if you have uh, opinions on Sean and other candidates that you wanna share with your friends and neighbors, make sure that you do that. And then most importantly, on November 3rd, encourage all of them to vote because none of this matters if you stay home, people stay home on November 3rd. You can have all the opinions and good ideas in the world. It doesn't matter if people come up to Sean the day after the election and say, gee, I meant to go vote for you, but I didn't get it done. <laughs> That's nothing a candidate ever wants to hear. Um, this concludes the formal part 
uh, our uh, questions that we had um, in advance and like. And what I'd like to do now is just to open this up for any uh, just general chit chat. Uh, please be respectful of each other. We can't all talk at once, obviously, in this setting. It's not quite like being in somebody's uh, 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 living room. So I want to thank uh, the uh, campaign for inviting me to be a part of this as your moderator and all of you for participating because you're the people who truly make a difference in making our government work. So open floor. James, we did get a question, one final question in from Joyce. Joyce, do you want to ask that? Sure, we, we live in a beautiful part of the state, but we also have karst topography so that any, any possible pollution to groundwater is more of a threat in our area than maybe the majority of the rest of the state. I wonder, do you have a, a plan that you might have to get a greater portion of the budget coming our way since we are in a unique geographical area? Well, I think we need to we need to make sure we've got the data to back that up. Now, the good thing that um, I have been learning throughout this process of us funding a water quality study in Richland County is that there are several state groups that are collecting water quality data. Um, there's UW Stevens Point where people can send their own drinking water to get tested. But then there's also, and I'm not sure if it's in Madison or if it's somewhere else, but there's actually some sort of a state lab, I believe, I'm not quite sure on this, and some others might know this better than I do, where um, milk gets tested um, for nitrates or, or other things. So farmers, they have to send it in. So for some reason, those systems aren't working together right now, and it's very hard to understand what's actually going on. You can't like my understanding is you can't really look at the state as a whole with all that data that's being collected and see where we have most drinking water quality problems. And so I think somehow we need to like solve some of those bureaucratic issues that we got going on right now so that we can really get a sense for where more of the water quality problems are and then make that case that, you know, we're the area that should get a greater percentage of the, the funding. And I've heard that, you know, definitely, Joyce, you know, you hear that and um, especially areas that have sinkholes, you know, that that can be a really b big problem um, where the water directly goes into the aquifer. So, yeah, we we need we need some more information, I think, to make that case would be my guess, unless someone knows about any great study or two pager that I can look at that explains that already. And then I, I get educated a lot right now by people <laughs> and they send me links to things and and then I end up learning a lot, so don't be shy. If anybody's wondering why people are smiling, um, we had a little scene stealer over here. Brianna <laughs> had, had a younger guest that was just wonderfully photogenic. Uh, Michelle, you, you're raising your hand. Yep. Um, so Sean, I just would like to get your ideas. Um, like I feel um, talking to a lot of people during the past couple of years, um, like everyone who lives west of 94 in Wisconsin um, feels that sometimes Madison, Milwaukee, um, the eastern side of the state kind of sucks up all the oxygen, you know, politically, money wise. And then we out here are kind of like, you know, Horton, here's a who. It's like, we're the who's living in Whoville. And we have all this like great stuff going on out our way in Southwest Wisconsin. Um, I think that can get overlooked like in Madison and at, at the Capitol. So I guess I wanted to get your thoughts on kind of creating a bigger, more collective voice of the people uh, in our, you know, corner of the state. Mm -hmm. I really liked that event we did with Francesca Hong, mm -hmm. you know, where she came to Platteville. And, you know, I could tell Francesca hadn't really been in rural areas that much before, you know, 
And I think Kayla has mentioned this idea to me uh, before as well. Like, it'd be so great to have like exchanges, even in our country, so people can see different life, you know, different uh, ways of life, you know, in different states or parts of the country or urban and rural areas. And I think, yeah, we need we need more like that. Um, I I feel like the Republicans who are in control in the legislature right now they love to like bitch and complain about how rural areas don't ever get anything and that people just, they don't even know how, you know, where milk comes from, that it comes from a cow anymore. They like to bring up these like anecdotes that make urban people look really dumb, of which they do. I mean, that, that does happen. <laughs> um, but I think instead, if we bring our story to the urban people about we need to make the case for why rural areas are so vital and important. You know, not just because they provide food, but like you might not even understand all the struggles we've been through out here. And, you know, we have, we have lost so much out in these rural areas. People have migrated away. Um, you know, all these schools have closed businesses. It just all these things have happened to us. And I don't think people even have the slightest that that, that stuff has happened. And, or a lot of them don't, you know. And so I think we, we somehow need to be bringing that story and, and that story's got to come through at budget time when we're setting the budget. Um, we got to be bringing more, whatever we call it, economic development or what we, we got to have programs that actually work for rural areas. And I don't know why that got missed in the past 10 years. I don't know why they never passed a rural economic development bill that they said they wanted, um, you know, I, I, I just think they've, this happens all the times and I feel like it's with Democrats too. You know, they just forget about rural areas. We really do get forgotten yeah. about. And that's why I wanted this campaign to be just about rural yeah. areas. We, we gotta have more of a focus on this. So, so if we do win, yeah. <laughs> then we've got a clear mandate, you know, and that's what I want. Yeah. And we're gonna get some stuff out of those people yeah. <laughs> if we win, <laughs> so. Yeah. When you win. Yes, when. I know you guys are always so good about that. People do that to me all the time. I, I try to, you know, be realistic at what if in case we don't. <laughs> but yes. It's 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 part of your nature to be modest. It's not ours. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay, uh, we're getting very close to the end of our hour here, and I know that um um, most of us uh, are likely to be uh, going to our TV sets to uh, watch another um, dis political discussion. I want to again thank everyone. Well, first, I want to thank Sean uh, for you know, running for political office. Greatly appreciate your candidacy. Thanks, you guys. I'm having a really good time doing this. I am really enjoying it way more than I thought. I, I thought it would be a lot scarier, and it's really not. <laughs> it's not as bad once you just jump in and do it so i it's an honor to be running it really is i appreciate all the support you guys have been so great to me and to all thanks of for you, hosting james too you know, my, really my, nice to have my you do pleasure. It. but uh thank all of you for participating here tonight um on november 3rd vote like your future depends on it because it does those anecdotes, I want to say one other thing, those anecdotes, those conversations that people have, they really do help, even if it's just something very tiny. Like one lady I met today said she didn't even know who, she had a Biden sign out front, but didn't, you know, I said, I'm Sean, I'm running for state assembly. She wasn't aware of me. And then I said my name and she said, oh yeah, so-and-so was at the Owl Cafe with you. And... <laughs> They said you were nice. You didn't bring up politics and they, they were surprised you didn't preach about politics. So yeah, we're supporting you. And like, it just, these little things sometimes spread, you know, these just tiny, tiny little stories. So it doesn't have to be anything like canned. I think the more authentic, the better. Um, so if you got something to say, yeah, say it, but don't, don't pretend, you know, just say what's in your heart or your mind about it. You know, that's that's usually the best policy. And that's what I try to do when I'm campaigning, even if I have to repeat the same thing over and over again, 250 times. <laughs> so.
All right, that concludes our um, farm uh, forum for this evening. Thank you for joining us. Hi everyone, it's been great. Enjoy the debate. People who actually debate, can you believe it? <laughs> we'll see if they actually debate. True, that's a good point. Hopefully they don't just yell. Someone put a water quality study in the chat for you, Sean. Oh, oh, thank you. Wasn't me, it was somebody else. Yeah, from Marty, cool. Thanks for pointing that out. Hi, Nora. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me, Nora, but hi. <laughs> We're just taking off, Nora. We're going to watch the vice presidential debate. <laughs> Bye, Kayla. Talk to you later. Thanks for getting all this organized. Bye. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Okay. <laughs>